It was, it was a, a, a expression was, do I really have no time for memes at all? And absolutely right, I have no time for memes at all. <laughs> and I'll just reiterate the three main reasons. First of all, the kind of things that are invoked as memes, as units, they're not really units. They don't have any inherent unity. Take free, tolerance of free speech. I mean, uh, that isn't a bounded unity that can be transmitted in a way that a gene is a clearly bounded unity. So the analogy is completely, uh, the, the analogy is completely fake. Um, a tune perhaps has a bounded unity, but all of the other things don't. And of course, because people realize that life wasn't just, or some of the evolution psychologists realize that things weren't made of bits and pieces, you required rather more broader things. They started talking about mean, mean, mean plexus, religion as an example. Well, what's a mean plex? You know, then it's a, a cluster of units, but it's still they are not themselves inherently unitizing, so they can't be delivered as a unit to that level. Um, secondly, um, it's the way they collect together. You know, you have this number of notion of the mind, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the other. That's not how things are. We have a coherent, global, continuous sense of things, and we make, we make sense of it continuous. I mean, how many memes are, you know, am I caught up in at the moment? How many memes are there in this room? It's, 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 when you start asking those straightforward, childlike questions, you realize how utterly barren uh, the, 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 the idea is. And the third one relates to passivity. I mean, some of the things have to be worked at. When you think about tolerance of free speech, sometimes I really have to grit my teeth and think, yeah, I hate what this person is saying, but I remember there's a principle, you know, I loathe what you're saying, but I'll defend you your death right to say. It. It, it's a struggle to, to adhere to it. So there's nothing passive about that meaning at all. Genes are unitary, they're passive, and they're stitched together in a very automatic, coherent way, and the memes are nothing like that. So you're not allowed, as it were, to take the glamour of genes and project them into memes, because there's nothing that remains of genes in memes, apart from some kind of ass assonance. Assonance as well. <laughs> well, uh, I would just want to raise a real reminder point uh, about uh, what, what you said about the blind watchmaker metaphor, which seem, you seem to be being derogatory about even that. Yeah. Where, oh, perhaps I misunderstood, because it seems to me that's an absolutely brilliant metaphor for explaining si simply natural selection genetic. Um, well, if you weren't, if you, if you weren't integrating that, then my intervention is uh, to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very glad the opportunity to clarify, but perhaps I do want to click that more question, or shall I clarify that, um, David, or...? Please. Yes, I mean, I think the metaphor is fantastic. I mean, uh, people will be familiar with, with it. If you remember, Paley and his evidence as the existence of design in the universe said, if you came across a watch, you would come to the conclusion that it must have been designed by somebody. It, had a, you know, it couldn't have happened by accident. If you look at human beings, or indeed any organism, they are even more complex than watches. So clearly, there must have been some process of design that produced organisms, human beings, or whatever. What Richard Dawkins said, well, hang on a moment, there wasn't any conscious uh, designer, it was the selective survival of different variants of um, living, living matter that gradually produced more and more complex organisms. This was the process, the blind watchmaker that generated of the species. But at some stage, i.e. when human beings arrive, we have things called sighted watchmakers. Mm -hmm. You know, people who actually consciously, deliberately do design things. And so within human beings, we have to restore the notion of the sighted watchmaker, because I know a few watchmakers who do things deliberately. <laughs> or tailors, or, you know, whatever. So that's, that, that's where the problem with the blind watchmaker analogy is that if it applies throughout to human life as well, even to people who make watches. So that's what I was my point. I hope that's clear. Yeah. Right, Rita next. And um, given what you said, Roy, about, about the um, seamlessness and holistic nature of human behaviour, um, and thought, do you think there's any merit at all in taking an analytical approach to human behaviour, or do you think that the entire project of psychology for the last few hundred years and uh, neuroscience for the last few decades has been a good problem? I think it's a really good question, because of course one has to analyse things to some extent. The question is, what is an appropriate mode of analysis? And be sure also that you don't develop a model or a theory that lies ahead, and that lay, is, is, is premature and way ahead of any um, useful form analysis. I mean, for example, my, all my research was in stroke rehabilitation, and so I'm very grateful to those neuroscientists 
you know, who were able to tease out bits of the brain that are responsible for movement, sensation, and so on and so forth. They haven't delivered yet, but they do promise in the future that we will get better modes of rehabilitation. I seriously mean that. So there is, there is an appropriate time for analysis, an appropriate time for being holistic. And I don't think I quite know when one should be either. But I'm damn sure that, as it were, dissolving human behavior into component means is a wrong mode of analysis. A gentleman there. I will make a, a defense of me, not, <laughs> <laughs> not, not such a robust one, because I share some theory. But um, I think what Mr. Hawkins was wanting to do was uh, originally was say there was cultural evolution as well as biological evolution. I think we would agree that. And I think the, the common um, features that he found in the, in between um, the evolution and those two kinds of evolution were that um, there's variation in these things, um, there's replication, and there's mutation. And I think those are important things that cultural evolution and genetic evolution do share. Um, when, I, when, the first, when, when I first looked at that means, I thought, it's just so obvious. And then when, when this kind of response came up, I thought, what's the fancy about I mean, there are these things. Um, I think it's, um, there is some pragmatic use in having something like the mean concept. I agree with some things you said. So I don't think in principle, you know, it's, it has to be. But I think it's just been a useful kind of concept in thinking about cultural evolution. And that's more precisely, there are models of gene culture co-evolution, um, which are very useful <coughs> and um, mathematical and used in modeling, uh, imitation, and the development of cultural artifacts. And in that, you need some kind of units put in your model. So I think it's had pragmatic use in this too. Yes, I mean that's a methodological defence, but I'd like yeah, you to I'll tell me an example that. of one where it has been of use and uh, by what criteria was it used for? Uh, Either use of this concept. Is that all right, Jim? Yeah. Um, I don't really want to pick out a uh, one that's been useful. Um, I can't think of one at the moment. Well, you could have said there have been one useful, and it would be nice to have one that was useful. Well, I think the, I think whatever you want, well, if you want to talk about, say, fashions, um, well, I don't think myself, it adds much to say to me, if you want to think about how fashions are brought on or haven't brought on, I think it does help when you, if you start drawing metaphors from, from genetic evolution, you take this variation in fashions, um, this particular fashion, um, say, the 1940s took on because it didn't use much cloth, you know, because it was, it was adapted, that kind of thing. It's somewhat used to think to thought about me, but I don't want to put much in the stuff on, on that. And that um, example is doomed by the facts, because you know the new look with long skirts came out in the time of extreme rationing in 1947, so you would think it was massively non-adaptive. I know it's actually largely confined to people who could afford a small group who can get, you know, T-Maxes or whatever it is, Primark is it's, it's bread and more. So I think that example is, is, is a very unfortunate one, terribly, but actually it doesn't add to the sense that people, yes, sometimes, something can. They, they, they imitate each other and they're persuaded by conversations that looking in a certain way looks good. Um, but that's not like the transmission of a gene. It has nothing. It has an inevitability. It, it's negotiated. I mean, I don't respond. People talk about, say, finding a tune in your head. Well, the tunes are going around in my head are Renaissance polyphony. The tunes are going around and people have to take that. You know, and clearly there's some kind of, it's not simply because, uh, you know, memes diffuse in different directions and I'm sort of passive because I seek out that stuff and other people seek out and take that because they associate it with a good night out and picking up a bird and all that sort of stuff. Mm. It's quite complicated. I think it's a lot more complicated, yes. But, uh, but I think just to some of these similarities like replication, mutation, variation are sufficiently global and similar to make some sort of comparison useful to some extent. But I agree that there are differences too. Yes, you see, I mean, the, the very word replication it sort of rather frames it. It makes it sound like uh, you, know, you use the word replication in relation to genes, you use the word replication in relation to means, therefore they're rather similar things, or indeed that the second term is justified. Is, is my deciding to wear a long skirt as opposed to a short skirt um, really a uh, replication in that sense? Yeah, because I see one or two other people wearing a similar short skirt. Yeah. Okay.